Now tonight, now our subject is grasshoppers, giants, and God. And we'll put in uh, the oar here at the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers and read the 26th verse through the 33rd verse. Will you listen very carefully? And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Now these are the spies that had been sent into the land to spy it out before the children of Israel entered. This is their report. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb still the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giant, the son of Anak, which come of the giant. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now tonight we do have a text, and the text is verse 33. Let me read it again. And there we saw the giant, the son of Anak, which come of the giant. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now our subject is grasshoppers, giants, and God. I'm sure tonight that most of you folks have been to a state fair, and I'm sure that when you were at the state fair that you wandered down the midway. You probably saw the house of mirrors, and if you're like I am, you're curious, you probably went in there. And if you did, you saw all kinds of mirrors that would give a distorted uh, image of you. That was a mirror that made you look tall. That was another mirror that made you look skinny. That was a mirror that made you look fat. That was another mirror that gave you a big blot and a little head, and vice versa. I was looking, by the way, in a mirror the other day, and it made me look fat. But I found out it was not a trick mirror at all. It was really telling the truth. But these are trick mirrors that you have in these houses of mirrors. But may I say to you tonight that actually most of us are looking at life through distorted mirrors the problems that we see are all out of focus. Uh, the different situations, the people that we meet, we see very little in this life that's really in focus. Or oh, it may be that we have 20-20 vision, but uh, life is out of focus for most of us tonight. We do not see things as they really are. Many folk tonight are looking in the mirror of fear, and when they look there, they see themselves depressed and pushed down, and their burdens and problems are like mountains, and they are lost in these mountains and overwhelmed and overcome by them. Then there are folk that look into the mirror of pride, 
And when they look there, they see themselves magnified and made large and big, and they're all out of proportion. There are those that look into the mirror of criticism, and they, they can see the defects in others. They're always able to pick out the flaws that are in other folks. Then there are people tonight that look into the mirror of covetousness, and my, they, they see things they want. In fact, the minute they look in the mirror, they have a bad case of the gimme. They want this, and they want that, and they want the other thing. And then there are folk that look in the mirror of love, and they see others. They see others lovely, winsome, some folk that they care a great deal for. May I say to you, all of us tonight are looking into a mirror, and we're getting a distorted view, most of us, of life. Now, the, the children of Israel, when they came to Kadesh Barnea, they looked through the trick mirror of unbelief at the promised land. And as a result, they got a distorted view of it. Their perspective was wrong, and everything was out of focus. Well, you see, it was at Kadesh Barnea that they were to enter the land. God had made every arrangement for them. Kadesh Barnea was just a whistle stop on the route down from Jerusalem to Egypt. It was a very small place, but it was very important for them, and it became their Waterloo. It became the place of their severest defeat. Now, they came there, and they even, they even did wrong, by the way, in sending in spies. And I'm afraid sometimes that we just read one record. God sometimes gives two or three records to give us a full orb picture. And when we read the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, we might get a wrong impression. For it reads like this, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. Now when you read that, you get the impression immediately that it was God's idea to send in the spies when that actually is not the truth. The book of Numbers gives us the human history of what took place. But when you turn to the book of Deuteronomy, you get God's interpretation. And when you turn to the first chapter of Deuteronomy, I read this verse, and will you listen to this? It's verse 22. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us. They shall search us out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. You see, it wasn't God's idea to send in spies. God told them to go in and possess the land, but when they got there, they made the suggestion. They said to the Lord, if you don't mind, we'll send in spies. And Here's another case of where the psalmist later on says he granted their request, but he sent leanness to their souls. Did you know there are certain things that you and I ought not to pray for? Because God will hear and answer a prayer, but our souls will become dried up. Oh, how dangerous it is for Christians to pray for some things. I'm confident that God kept me poor going through school to keep from me becoming a fool. I'm sure I would have become if I'd have been a rich fella. And I remember going through school watching those other fellas with money and cars, and I used to say, oh, my, my how unfair God's been to me. But I can look back today and thank God for that, my beloved. And I used to pray for it. You know, God knows better what we need than we do ourselves. But sometimes we keep after a thing, and he'll hear and answer our prayer, and leanness will come to our souls. Now, that's what happened here. The children of Israel actually didn't need to send in spies. Do you know why? God had already spied out the land. God already knew all about it. 
God permitted them to send in spies, and it revealed their unbelief. They were not trusting God fully. If they had been, they never would have sent in spies, and you'll note that the spies never brought back any new information at all. And so they picked men, and they picked outstanding men. I don't have time to go down the list, but they picked the heads of the tribe. Among those was Caleb and Joshua, and they brought back the minority report. But these other men were outstanding men, and the spies did a thorough job. Let's give them credit. When they made their report, may I say to you, that Moses could well have said to them, gentlemen, you have done a good job on this committee because we read here that they went as far as Hamath. And if you look up Hamath, it's way in the north. They went all the way through the promised land, spying it out. They did a good job, by the way. Now, may I also say something else in their favor? Their report was factual and it was accurate. Will you listen to it? And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sentest us. Surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now that was factual, that was true. But the interesting thing is, it didn't add one bit of information to what God had already told them. God had already told them it was a land flowing with milk and honey. God had already told them there were giants there. God had told them everything they found out. But they wanted to send in spies. And God acceded to that, and he, he let them do it. They merely confirmed God's report. Now, will you notice, having given the fact, they looked through that trick mirror of unbelief, and this is what they saw. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now may I say that when they looked through the mirror of unbelief and of doubt, this is what they saw. They misinterpreted the facts, and the facts were distorted and twisted and brought all out of shape, actually this was not true at all. Now, what was it that they saw? And let's look in the mirror tonight and see what it is they saw. First of all, they said they saw giants. May I say the giants were there? And I'm not talking about the team that's playing in San Francisco. That's not what they saw. They saw giants. They saw the real artists. They saw men that were men of great stature. And I want to say to you tonight, friends, that when they saw them, they certainly were afraid. And when they looked at them, though, honestly, they kept on looking at them and they got bigger than they really were. Finally, they came to the conclusion after they had looked at giants all up and down the land that it was an insurmountable barrier to get over and they never could take the land. They just saw them out of proportion. They had an exaggerated view of giants. I've told you the story about the little boy that came in the house and says, Mama, Mama, there's a lion out there in the yard. And his mother, because the little fellow was given to exaggeration, thought she'd give him a good lesson. She said, Son, that's no lion out there in the yard. I saw through the window what it was. It's nothing in the world but a big dog. And you are saying it's a lion. Now, I'm going to wash your mouth out. She did. Now she says, I want you to go upstairs and get down on your knees and ask God to forgive you for telling that big story. And so he went upstairs, and a little while he came down. And when he came down, his mother said, 
Did you ask God to forgive you? And he says, I did. And, and God said, when he first looked at the, the dog, he thought it was a lion also. <laughs> My friend, uh, you know, a lot of times the dogs look like lions in this world, and sometimes the giants look bigger than they are. May I briefly tell you about a man tonight that faced a giant, and uh, he, uh, he slew a giant. That's the thing that gave him his first notoriety. David slew Goliath. And you will recall that, uh, that David never once attempted to minimize the fact he was a giant. I think that's very interesting. David never once said, oh, he's nothing. I can bowl him over easy. These giants are not near as strong as you think they are. May I say to you, he never played down giants. They're just as big as they look, friends. David recognized it was a giant. But you see, David was a man of faith and a man of experience. He'd been with God, and he was able to go back to that. And this is so valuable in life. David said, look, you mean to tell me that there's nobody in the host of the Lord that will go out and fight that giant? David says, I'm no army man, but I'll go out and fight the giant. And they said, well, you're just a boy. David says, wait a minute, that may be true, but I've had a little experience. I was out yonder keeping my father's sheep, and one day a lion came into that flock. Now, all of you know that a lion could overcome me. All of you know that a lion's bigger than I am, he's stronger than I am, he's faster than I am, and I couldn't overcome a lion. But you know, I was a shepherd, and I'd been out there with my harp singing praises to God, and I looked, and there came the lion and got one of the little lambs out of the flock, and I said, I'm the shepherd, and that can't be, and I went after him. And you know, I took that little lamb out of his claws, and uh, I took that lion and killed him. And when he started limping away, though, after I took that lion, you know, I took that slingshot of mine. I got him. <laughs> and I knew God was with me. Now, you may think that's an isolated incident. But another time, I was with the sheep. And we were going down to a very dark canyon. A bear came out. Now, you know a bear is bigger than I am. Anybody knows a bear can overcome me. But, you know, when I saw that bear take that little lamb, I went after him. And God again, he undertook for me. Now, that giant out yonder, he's not any bigger than a lion, he's not any bigger than a bear. God has already given me a victory. I don't expect to overcome him at all. But I tell you this, that giant is a giant, but he's not too big for me because God is with me. <laughs> you see, David saw the giant, but he was a, always just a giant. He never was anything else. Oh, friend, tonight, how many of us, as we go through life, we see the giant? And that's about all we see, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But Christ has said that we are more than conquerors through him. He has said that you and I can triumph. I'd like to pass on. I wish tonight I could spend a lot of time giving you some of the verses that for us today. Listen to Philippians 1, 28, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. But you say, well, Paul, if you had the enemies I got, you couldn't say that. 
Well, when Paul wrote this, he's in the Mamertine prison in Rome, and Nero has him there. And he says, don't be terrified by your adversaries. Uh, don't minimize them. The giants are there, my beloved, and they're just as big as giants get. But let's don't make them any bigger than they are. And the second thing these people saw, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. Listen again. There we saw the giant, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. That's well to be modest. We ought not to have an exaggerated uh, opinion of ourselves. I think in a Christian, one of the worst things in the world is to have an exalted opinion of self. I, I Personally, when somebody comes and says to me that they can sing or they can teach or do something, I'm always afraid of folk like that. The best teachers and the best singers and the best preachers are those that'll tell you I can't do it. You see, they're the ones. Oh, if you've got a teacher that says I can't teach, hold on to him. He's a good one. God can use him. The fellow that thinks he can do it, God can't use him, you see. And it's, it's nice to see yourself as a grasshopper. And the scripture says, all flesh is as the grass, but doesn't say grasshopper. And that the grass withers, the flower fadeth, the word of God's what abides, we don't, we are like the grass. And James, the practical, asked the question, what is your life? He answered, it's like a vapor on a mountainside. And Paul could say, Paul says, I know that it within me, that is, within my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's well to know that. But you know, there is a false modesty today. There is a false modesty today, and there are some people that hide back of that false modesty. Oh, I can't do it. I can't live for God. No, you can't. Let's face it, you can't. He said, without me, you can do nothing. But with him, you can do everything. Because listen to Paul, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And David, if I may go back to David a moment. They brought to David, you see, the armor of Saul. David tried it. David said, you know, <laughs> I'm not accustomed to this. But I do know how to use a slingshot. I wish you could have seen that bear when I hit him. Oh, he went over. And that John, I watched him go by there today. He's not any bigger than a bear. I can get him too. Oh, friend and I, it's well to see yourself as a grasshopper. But don't get so grasshoppery <laughs> that you can't that you can do all things in Christ. I must be brief. Somebody else is here. God. Let me read verse 33. And there we saw the giant, the sons of Anak, which come of the giant, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Somebody says, but... God's not in verse 33. Well, that's the whole point. That's right. God's not in verse 33. That was, their, that was their difficulty. We see. That's what the writer to the Hebrews says. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They just left God out. They saw the giant. They saw themselves as grasshoppers but they didn't see God. Oh, friend and I, it's well to see the giants. They are about us today. And I tell you, it's well to see ourselves as grasshoppers. But let's bring God into the picture. A 
because there's giants and grasshoppers, but there's God. Listen, I go back to David now. Do you think David thought that he would ever fail? Somebody says, I think David really thought he was going to fail because he only took five stones. And if he thought he was going to hit him, why did he take five stones? If you'll read it very carefully, you will find out that old Goliath had four sons. David thought the boys would be coming out. He took five stones. He needed only one for Goliath, and he knew it. Because this is what he said. Listen to him. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from this giant. Oh, my friend, I hope you see the giant there in Southern California. And I hope you see yourself as a grasshopper. I don't want to be cruel, but if that's all you see, you're blind. Oh, to see Christ and to be able to say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me and that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And he said, He that heareth my word believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. High up in the Rockies, between Denver, Colorado, Salt Lake City, there's a place known as Berthoud Pass. I have a notion that many of you have been there. When I was there, they told me that you could stand. There was a great deal of snow then, but they said when this snow melts down, you can stand right there and take a chip. You can drop it into a little stream of the melting snow, and it'll find its way down the mountainside, out over the plains of Kansas, down through Arkansas into the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico and finally in the great Atlantic Ocean. But you can turn and take that same chip and just three feet away you can put it in another little stream and it'll find its way down the mountainside. It'll go babbling down between a canyon and it'll get into a larger canyon of the Colorado River find its wealth way in the Gulf of California and then out into the great Pacific Ocean. You can just stand at one place. And if you drop it there, it'll go to Atlantic. If you drop it here, it'll go to the Pacific Ocean. Kadesh Barnea was the birthood pass of Israel. But you see, they looked into the mirror of unbelief. And they dropped the chip in the wrong stream. How are you looking at life tonight? You see the giant? You see the grasshopper? But do you see God? in your life. Shall we pray? We're not going tonight to ask for any visible demonstration in an audience like this. But we trust that each one of you search your own heart and your own life What kind of a mirror are you looking in tonight? Do you see the giant? Do you see the grasshoppers? But tonight, are you looking upon a Savior who is able, he says, to save to the uttermost those who come unto God through him? Our gracious, loving Father God, we thank thee tonight 
for the wonderful privilege of choice thou hast given to each one of us. That thou hast given to us the privilege of choosing. And thou hast even brought us to a place, each one of us, where we can choose life or death. Where we can take the little ship of our life and drop it into a stream that will bring us to life. And we can drop it in another stream that leads to death. O oh God, tonight speak to our hearts and help us in making a right decision and help us above everything else to see the Savior tonight who's able to meet our needs, who's able to deliver us, who's able to save us, who is able to keep us, who is able to make us conquer us, who is able someday to present us before the throne of his presence. O oh God, tonight may we see him above the giant and the grasshopper. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>